Welcome to a new edition of New Energy for Europe, a regular news program that gives an insight into the emerging hydrogen economy. It's a show for anyone interested in the energy transition. In the next 15 minutes, we'll fully concentrate on the remarkable possibilities for the use of clean hydrogen in different kinds of transport, aviation, marine shipping, and heavy duty vehicles. And we are welcoming a special guest to comment on these developments. Last week, there was big news about the very first passenger flight partly flown on sustainably produced synthetic kerosene. Royal Dutch Shell, one of the leading energy companies in the world, and KLM announced that a passenger airplane had flown from Amsterdam Airport Schiphol to Madrid on a mixture of normal kerosene and 500 litres of sustainable synthetic kerosene. We are, we are very proud that last year we managed to make the, the first batch of 500 litres. It's uh, the biggest batch ever made by mankind. Uh, but as you can imagine, it's not yet enough to, to power a commercial aircraft. Um, so that's why we had to blend it in a dedicated Shell Aviation uh, truck with uh, additional fossil kerosene, so that the blend in total was enough to power the KLM aircraft to, uh, to Madrid this year. SAFs, sustainable aviation fuels made from renewable feedstock, can significantly reduce the industry's carbon footprint, and hydrogen can be used in producing it. Uh, synthetic kerosene uh, consists mainly of two ingredients. You need carbon, you need hydrogen. And the hydrogen in this case is uh, taken from uh, green hydrogen as the, as the main source. So that's one of the key ingredients. And the other one, the carbon, uh, we derived from uh, carbon dioxide. No, absolutely. This is uh, something we're super proud of. And uh, we're well aware that it's a small step. But uh, yeah, I'm confident that it can uh, lead to, uh, to great things. Yeah, absolutely. In the more remote future, it will be possible to use hydrogen as an energy carrier for a next generation of aviation engines. Airbus announced that it would introduce a hydrogen-powered aircraft by 2035. Mr. Bark Vivac is executive director of Brussels-based FCHJU, the fuel cells and hydrogen joint undertaking. Uh, welcome. Before dealing with the transport topics, could you first explain what your organization is doing? Well, our mission of the FCHJU is uh, basically to um, support or financially support research and innovation in, in the area of hydrogen and fuel cells. Uh, and the Commission has decided already quite a long time ago that they would like to do this in cooperation with the private side. That's why the FCHJU is a public-private partnership. And we have a couple of partners. One of our partners, as I said, is already the industry, and they, they call themselves Hydrogen Europe Industry. And there are almost like 200 companies in that association uh, working in the field. On the other hand, we have another private partner, which are the research centers, and we call them uh, Hydrogen Europe Research. And there are about uh, 83 uh, research centers well spread across Europe. And one, for example, in the Netherlands is TNO. I'm sure you know them. Yeah. But th these are the kind of uh, research centers which are part of our uh, of the association. And then the third partner, and it's of course the, the very important partner, is the European Commission, because they are putting basically the money on the table for us in order to be able to support uh, such uh, uh, research and innovation projects in Europe. Just for the record, today we have uh, 285 projects in Europe. Uh, supported and we supported that for about 1 billion euro uh, a little bit more than 1 billion euro and since this since this is a public private partnership also the private partners contribute the same amount so you can say it's like a euro for a euro so altogether since uh, back 2008 we have now spent a little bit over 2 billion euros in the field of research and demonstrations of hydrogen and fuel cells so that's what we are doing now back to the aviation industry what could be the role of green hydrogen for aviation? Could we expect emission-free flights in Europe, for example? Uh, as you might remember, I mean, last year we, we finished a study with the another joint undertaking, public-private partnership, which we call them Clean Sky, especially working on aviation industry. We worked together and we said, look, does hydrogen has a, an important role to play in decarbonization of the, the aviation? And can we basically build uh, planes completely propelled by only hydrogen. And the conclusion of that study was quite uh, impressive. Actually, yes, it can. The, the study also showed that 
probably the regional uh, planes, so I mean planes up to 3,000, 4,000 kilometers, as you mentioned, probably Madrid to, to, to Berlin or, or these kind of uh, distances uh, in hub inside Europe, probably those kind of planes will be able to be propelled pure by hydrogen, liquid form. Then it could be by a turbine, gas turbine, or it could be done by a pure fuel cell. Probably both will be there or a combination of both uh, can be there, but it will be done. So the idea is by 2035 to make this kind of planes commercially available. And uh, also that we um, will build a demonstrator together with the other public private partners, Clean Sky, by 2028. Shell and KLM used SAF, sustainable aviation fuel, for this first flight. So there was no direct but indirect use of hydrogen. How will this fuel develop in the industry? When we talk about the longer distance planes, Amsterdam, Rio de Janeiro, eh, for example, this is over 10,000 kilometers. For that, uh, we will have to use sustainable aviation fuels. Mm. Means that, let's take the example of methanol, but to make methanol sustainable, you will need also the hydrogen. The, so the hydrogen will be a building block to make uh, that uh, fuel. So in any case, you will need, for to decarbonize the aviation, you will need hydrogen being in it as a sustainable aviation fuel, like methanol, for example, uh, or being it in its pure form, both will be there. And we believe, and that's also what the study said, that after 2050, when we have new designs of planes, at that time, probably also longer distances uh, can be propelled by pure hydrogen. OK. Also in the maritime sector, we see telltale developments. The demand for new ships is collapsing due to fuel uncertainty. What kind of engines to choose from? Do fossil fuel based engines survive another few decades or not? The number of ships ordered in the past year has fallen by almost 50% compared to 2019, and demand is now at its lowest level in at least two decades. This follows from data from IHS Market. Uncertainty about the future of alternative fuels is the main explanation for the sharp downturn. I can imagine that there is a kind of hesitation. I am absolutely sure that hydrogen will be one of the most important candidates uh, for the future of shipping. The vital question here is, how do you store it? As a gas, as a liquid, or as solid matter? Delft University of Technology is looking at powdered hydrogen instead of liquid or pressurized hydrogen. Now, we are researching um, uh, a solid state of hydrogen uh, in, for instance, sodium borohydride, in which the volumetric density reaches the density of what we know as the fossil fuel. And that, that is very interesting uh, for ship operators. And on, on top of that, you can imagine that uh, when you would like to transport that hydrogen carrier and it is solid, it's quite easy to bring it to even the smallest harbor. Hydrogen in solid form is safe and easy to bunker. However, there is still an issue with upgrading the residue to a reusable fuel. Uh, from a scientific pers perspective, I am quite optimistic on that. Uh, we are working on demonstrators now in 2021 uh, to, uh, to show that performance. So this is really a very uh, interesting stepping stone uh, towards uh, zero emission ships. But do the support programs of FCHJU also cover the development of hydrogen as a marine fuel? be it in solid or liquid form? And we just awarded uh, a project at the end of last year, which will put two megawatt of fuel cell on a ship uh, propelled by liquid hydrogen as well. And this will be done in, in, in Norway. Uh, the, the, the name of that is, we call it the Ship FC project. Uh, and, and so it just started, but you see that we, we went also from kilowatt to megawatt scales, bigger, uh, vessels will be able to be propelled by hydrogen, but also here we will have the same story as the aviation. Again, for inland waterways, for inside ports, uh, this type of, of, of vessels, which require uh, maybe uh, 2 megawatt, 3 megawatt, 5 megawatt kind of uh, fuel cells, they can be propelled by pure hydrogen. Uh, I can think about ammonia, for example. Uh, it can be also other fuels, but ammonia, Again, when you produce ammonia, you will need to have the green hydrogen. So again, hydrogen will help to decarbonize maritime, whether it be it pure or be it in another fuel. Let's finally take a look at the heavy duty vehicles, HGVs or trucks, if you like. 
5% of all greenhouse gas emissions in the European Union are caused by HDVs. Now, the Black Horse Project in Central Europe, an ambitious initiative headed up by the four so-called Visegrad countries, seeks to seriously lower this number. How? By launching a plan for 10,000 emission-free hydrogen trucks. Quite a bold idea was born in the four Visegrad countries, the Czech and Slovak republics, Poland and Hungary. They named it the Black Horse Project. If you're asking uh, what does uh, the Black Horse uh, contain or what, it, what is it about, it's, it's the whole hydrogen value chain. So uh, yeah, it's all the way from the green electricity production to uh, green hydrogen production to the distribution to the refueling stations and then all the way to the trucks that would uh, consume the, the green hydrogen. Building a hydrogen value chain in Central Europe with 40 electrolyzers and 270 filling stations to be built. But where should the green hydrogen be produced? So either it would be solar plants or uh, wind, uh, wind farms or uh, hydro plants. Uh, for example, in Slovakia, we're really thinking uh, that hydro power plants are, are the solution because uh, we have lots of dams and lots of green electricity produced uh, that way. So this could be a solution. Black Horse is waiting for approval by the European Commission. According to the coalition of plan makers, this project provides exactly what these regions need, progress and vitality. You have lots of regions, for example, in Poland or in Czech Republic, coal regions that will, yeah, the coal mines will have to be shut down. So this would be a choice for the, uh, or an option for, uh, for the workers to, to find new jobs in, in the hydrogen economy. Yeah, it would, it would be re really beneficial for the, for the V4 countries and to show uh, also to the Western part of the European Union that something cool could, can be achieved in, in the Eastern part as well. More on hydrogen trucks. A consortium of 62 companies under the umbrella of Hydrogen Europe has marked another spot on the horizon. They came up with some very clear objectives for 2030. Mr. Bivak, can you tell us some more? Well, we see that the, the biggest potential to decarbonize the truck uh, sector is through hydrogen. And that's also why at the end of last year, the consortium has announced that they commit to put 100,000 trucks and 1,500 hydrogen refueling stations by 2030 in the field. And they need to, eh? because I can tell you the European Union, they had set very severe targets for the truck sector to be achieved by 2030. And I think that the European Union took that decision was very crucial because at that point, suddenly all the truck OEMs came also to knock on our doors and say, hey, we need programs, support programs for uh, research into hydrogen because we have now these strong uh, targets. Before the union decided on those targets, we barely saw them. So you can see that policy makes really a difference and can push a certain uh, can push it into a certain direction. So this is will require billions of euros for investment first. Who's going to pay for that? The private sector or taxpayers? Well, last year in July, uh, Europe made a, a European hygiene strategy. And at the same time, they announced the, uh, uh, the, the Clean Hygiene Alliance. Basically, it's a huge club of CEOs. I mean, now almost like 1000 companies are in there. Uh, that basically they line up all the projects to create a pipeline of investments in order to achieve the 2030 goal. We should not misunderstand that the amount of investments that will be required to achieve the targets by 2030 is around 470 billion euro. And only from public side will be only a fraction of that. I mean, probably Europe will put a few billions in that. We heard about Germany putting 9 billion euro in hydrogen, France 7 billion euro, Spain, Portugal uh, a couple of billion. So, but again, that will come maybe to 5%, 10% of the total amount that we will need. So we will need to also mobilize the entire uh, sector to invest and also the investment companies. So why do you think that the European general public isn't aware of a lot of these initiatives going on? At least that's our view, and that's why we created New Energy for Europe. Hydrogen fuel cell is something that the general audience doesn't know. They are not so familiar with. And I believe now that policymakers, CEOs uh, or, of, of big uh, companies are now convinced that this technology works and that it can be done. And now, indeed, the next step, as you correctly said, is start to make the awareness among in, in society that this technology basically works 
that it has huge potential, can create jobs, it can create growth. So we should all embark. For, for me, this is the, the, the big challenge, to make it a project within the society that everybody can embark on that mission. It should be a mission of 500 million people all together. Let's make it happen eh? because we all care about the climate at the end eh? for our children and grandchildren. So, and this is, I think, the next mission that we have. Try to engage the people now because at the end, they will have to buy the product. Mr. Bivak, thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Within one or two weeks, you can expect our next edition. Sign up on the website to be notified about this and drop your ideas for future newscasts. This is newenergyforeurope.com.